Well, it's, it's, it's time now for us to introduce our speaker. We are so delighted to have Dr. Christoph Franz with us here today. Christoph serves as Chairman of the Executive Board and Chief Executive Officer of the Lufthansa Group. The Lufthansa Group is a global aviation organization with more than 400 subsidiaries and associated companies. It is comprised of five business segments, which includes passenger like group, logistics, MRO, catering, and IT services. Under his leadership, each of these segments occupies a leading position in their sector. After receiving his doctorate from Darmstadt University in Germany, Christoph joined Deutsche Lufthansa AG in 1990. He later moved to Deutsche Bahn AG where he held various executive positions, culminating in his appointment as executive board and CEO of Passenger Rail Transport. In 2004, he was appointed CEO of Swiss International Airlines, where he led the successful turnaround and integration of Swiss into Lufthansa Group. After the integration, Christoph joined the executive board of the Lufthansa Group as deputy chairman and, and further served as chairman of the executive board of Lufthansa German Airlines, where he oversaw the passenger airline business. He has been in his current position since January 2011, and we are very honored to have Christoph here today at the Wings Club. Please give him a round welcome. Dear members of the Wings Club, dear friends of Lufthansa, thanks for joining this luncheon, and uh, dear Kevin, thanks for inviting me to give you a little luncheon speech. Um, it is a great honor for me to be here, and uh, we have a saying in Germany that a full stomach makes a happy heart. I'm therefore very pleased to speak to you after lunch <laughs> and address happy hearts instead, instead of empty stomachs. I thank you for the opportunity to give a little insight on the European airline industry, and I will also look into the common interest with the United States. For us, the core of global aviation has always been the Atlantic Aviation Partnership. Not far from here, on Lower Broadway, there is a tiny star engraved in the pavement, commemorating the first nonstop flight across the Atlantic westbound. It took place in 1928. The captain was Hermann Köhl, a Lufthansa pilot. When Lufthansa headquarters got words about his plane to cross the Atlantic, they immediately dismissed him <laughs> because they felt this is too risky. Uh, these were the wild days of aviation, ladies and gentlemen. Captain Köhl ignored the dismissal. Instead, he took one of our planes, successfully landed not too far from New York. Here, he was honored with a ticker tape parade at the Canyon of Heroes to celebrate his pioneer flight. This was when we swiftly rehired him. <laughs> at least, so goes the telling. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, along with this nice little anecdote comes three messages. First, there is a long-standing aviation relationship between Germany and New York. Second, Lufthansa was very has very dedicated employees and the best technology. Both still holds true today. And last but not least, we do not take uncalculated risks, but if the facts change, we have no problem to change our minds too, especially when good business opportunities are around the corner. In this respect, we founded Star Alliance in 1997. In the meantime, we have created Atlantic Plus Plus, a very success successful commercial joint venture with uh, Air Canada and our founding member of Star Alliance, United Airlines. Our joint venture with these two great airline partners has made us market leaders, and we plan to intensify our cooperation with United Airlines in different fields of business. 
The United States remains our single most important market outside Germany. We fly to three Canadian and 17 US destinations from our three gateways in Germany, Frankfurt, Munich, and Düsseldorf. And we fly with Swiss to Geneva and Zurich, with Austrian Airlines to Vienna, and with Brussels Airlines to the EU capital, connecting passengers to our global network. Year by year, we bring more than one million guests to New York, and the numbers are still rising. Our airlines offer more than 50 flights across the Atlantic every single day. And uh, this makes us the leading European airline group in this country. In addition to all that, we are an important employer here in your country and feel as a US citizen. We are proud of having more than 14,000 employees here in this country, skilled staff, good salaries, and good career perspectives. They work for our success in all business segments of the Lufthansa Group, and Kevin has already mentioned, it's not only about the airline business, but it's also about our airline services in the field of maintenance, repair, overhaul in the area of air cargo, catering, and IT services. And to complete the list, we are a loyal business partner investing several hundred million dollars each year here in your country. We have partnerships with Honeywell, Pratt & Whitney, and General Electric. We have been a major shareholder of JetBlue for many years now, I think still the major shareholder in New York's home airline. Our special focus has always been our strong and successful relationship with the Boeing company for more than 50 years now. Products of this bilateral partnership have been the Boeing 737, especially created because Lufthansa needed this type of an aircraft, and the chief engineer in Boeing was absolutely convinced nobody else will buy this aircraft anywhere. <laughs> we are happy that the number, manufacturing number 6000 has been delivered some two or three years ago. And right, very recently, Lufthansa was the launching customer for the Boeing 747-8 Intercontinental. I think this is a partnership with a great past and a great future ahead. Just a couple of months ago, in September, we have placed an order and a joint launch of the Boeing 777-8X that will enter into service in 2020. Altogether, our current investment in Boeing products runs to well over $10 billion not taking into account our historic portfolio. As you see, we are a committed part and partner of the transatlantic relationship. So let's take a brief look at the status of the industry with a special focus on Europe. The good news, first of all, aviation is growing long term on an average of around 5% annually. The global market trend is still upward. The interesting question for all of us is, however, where is this aviation growth taking place and how? In fact, growth development, trends, and the political framework could hardly be more different in Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and the Americas. The industry has become very heterogeneous and complex. The competition in air traffic has become considerably tougher within the last few years. Today, we are not only involved in a competition between different companies, but we feel that we are more and more involved in a competition of systems. On the one hand, highly integrated state aviation systems of ambitious nations in the Middle East and in some cases also in Asia. And on the other hand, we have privatized airline companies in Europe and in the United States 
which operate in highly complex aviation systems, sometimes even confronted with suppliers like ADC or airports, which are natural oligopolies or monopolies, with very heterogeneous also interest. There, we have optimal framework conditions and promotions from politics in Europe, I must say, we allow ourselves one or the other regulatory luxury. For example, inflexible night flight bans, continuously increasing charges for air traffic controls and airports, a European emission trading system which unilaterally affects the European airlines and in several countries, an exclusive and very expensive aviation tax. The consequences are obvious. Distorted competition. In air traffic, the old continent is clearly behind the Mideast, Asia and the Americas, and not only, and only just in front of Africa. The average margin for US carriers is around 4.5% in the United States, 4.1% in Asia, but only 1.3% average margin in Europe. With this margin, our industry cannot survive independently. The collapses of two long-established carriers in Europe, the Hungarian flag carrier, Malev, and Spain's Spanair, underscore the grim financial reality in our industry in Europe. In Germany, one traditional airline, Cirrus, is bankrupt. Another, Air Berlin, is fighting very hard, and its biggest shareholder is now Etihad, the state airline of Abu Dhabi. And you must not be a prophet to see that more change in Europe is about to come. The United States, with a home market of about 300 million people, now has roughly 10 airlines and five of them taking an 85% share of the total market. And now this market is doing fine. In Europe, the consolidation process still lags far behind. There are three airline groups and a few big low-cost carriers, but still maybe around 50 carriers for a home market of 500 people. 500 million people, sorry. <laughs> that's too many carriers and that's too much capacity. I'm sure that some of the carriers will step out of the market, others will move under the roof of a larger airline group. And there might be a few niche players around also in the future who can survive with their very specific business model. But I'm also sure that the overall picture in Europe will change and will have to change. This goes also for the single European sky issue. Here in the United States, you have one single air traffic control system and only half as expensive as the existing systems in Europe. Because in Europe, we enjoy the multitude and variety of 47 air traffic control organizations. The additional unnecessary cost in Europe is around 5 billion euros a year. EU politicians have been working on this issue for several decades now, but here in the US, I've, we feel you are still a big, big step ahead, and we do not see that this situation will be overcome within the next uh, five to 10 years, though we are hoping that there is some progress with regards to integrating the different ATC organizations. Globally speaking, in addition, we have an increasing concern, not only in Europe, about the development in the Gulf region. And the carriers there are growing at a speed which is completely de decoupled from natural market development. Market economy usually requires a real market on both sides. But Emirates and Co. follow a different business model that can pri that then privately owned companies focusing 
on capturing market share regardless of profitability. This means that as world markets have opened, European companies, but also US companies, have found themselves frequently competing with governments rather than private firms who play by different rules and which are not subject to the same constraints as we are. Thus, we do not have a level playing field in the foreign, if the foreign competitor is a state-owned enterprise or a state-subsidized enterprise. And I'm not the only one being very vocal on this. I know that my colleague Richard Anderson from Delta Airlines is also very explicit about this. And these companies have placed orders for enormous numbers of wide body aircraft, which will soon be deployed against us in international markets. These orders have the potential to drive US airlines as well as European airlines out of these markets. Last year in September, for instance, Lufthansa has placed the biggest aircraft order ever in the history of the company. And uh, actually, it was more or less the biggest investment ever made by a private company in the industrial history of Germany. This made us really proud. But just a very few weeks later, our colleagues from Emirates ordered four times the number of planes completely disproportionate to their home market. This, ladies and gentlemen, is no longer only a threat for European airlines. The organization for the leading US airlines, A4A, commented these massive orders from the Middle East carriers as a fundamental threat for US airlines. America, as well as Europe, need strong airlines connect people and goods to the global economy out of their home markets and ensure at the same time the respective countries' competitiveness. For this reason, we in Germany fight our partners with our partners for a national airline policy to improve the tax and regulatory environment in order to be more in line with other industries and enable us to grow and prosper. And most importantly, we want our governments to stop actions that benefit foreign carriers over EU carriers. In Europe, we're going through intense restructuring measures, and we are doing everything in our power to sustainably strengthen our competitiveness. European airlines are shaping aviation for Europe for its citizens and companies. Here, a distinction must be made between those airlines which operate their hubs in Europe and those which simply fly in and out in order to siphon off international traffic. Of course, the latter also brings connections, but they cannot provide an integrating flight, integrated flight schedule and by no means develop the same added value and labor market effects. Despite, and that let me focus a little bit on the Lufthansa group, despite all these hurdles and restraints, we and our airlines, Lufthansa, German Wings, Swiss, Austrian Airlines, and uh, Brussels stand their ground as a market leader in Europe. Thanks to our own enormous efforts and also, let's be honest, some painful cuts. Through our corporate restructuring, we want to take the Lufthansa Group into a new performance level. And we attempt to achieve it in a challenging environment. We are streamlining administrative processes, trying to grab synergies wherever we can, increase efficiencies, cutting costs, developing new uh, interesting opportunities for ancillary revenues. And we are working particularly focusing on higher margins in our core business, the airlines. For instance, with our new European strategy. Now we have two businesses inside the Lufthansa Group in Germany. 
the Lufthansa Classic hub carrier model and German Wings, our low-cost airline, with an entirely new concept. Ladies and gentlemen, did you know that the crane, the symbol of our airline, can fly 3,000 miles or more without food? I guess we have learned a lot from this gracious bird. <laughs> Because at Lufthansa, we are constantly on diet if we have no luncheon in the Wings Club. <laughs> but our customers and friends should not suffer as a result. That's why we undertake a two-in-one strategy. So we cut, cut costs on the one hand and invest at the same time. Our success heavily depends on our investments in the fleet and products on board and on the ground. It is more, most important that we meet the customer's expectations and position ourselves as a top quality airline with a global outreach. I believe that uh, these investments will create lots of happy customers all over the world and uh, it is worth to invest the 36 billion euro uh, fixed order book which we have placed for nearly 300 aircraft in the next upcoming years. For us, this is at the same time not only an investment in a modern fleet, in fuel efficient aircraft um, and in modern products for you as our customers, but it is also the most effective environmental protection program. We had a record 105 million passengers in 2013 who flew with us. For the next two years, we have pushed, for two years, we have pushed change, and now we are on our way to emerge stronger and more competitive than ever. I know many of you are waiting for our new fully life flat business class seats. Our new business class is in fact part of the major investment effort we are undertaking. We currently spend 1 million euros each day for the replacement of our old seats. But given the size of our long haul fleet, it will take until July 2015 to refurbish our complete long haul fleet because we have to do it as part of our ongoing flight operations. We already offer you new business class on the Munich JFK flights and occasionally from Frankfurt to JFK. But the number of rebuilt aircraft is not yet sufficient, for example, to offer daily flights from Frankfurt to JFK. This year, in addition, we will start the new premium economy class we uh, will introduce a new wireless in-flight entertainment system, Board Connect, in our European uh, fleet, and uh, we invest in new lounges and much more for your convenience in the next years. Here in the US, we have introduced new aircraft to the American market. The A380 here, for example, to JFK and the Boeing 747-8i to uh, uh, places like Chicago and Washington. And we are continuing to do so, for example, with additional A350s and Boeing 777Xs in the future. This is all meant to strengthen our leading market position in Europe and the US. A strong Lufthansa is good for Europe and it is an efficient partner for America and the world. Ladies and gentlemen, so in closing, I would like to say that change seems to be a law of nature. And I can guarantee that it is never getting boring in the airline industry. But one thing, although a quite different topic, will never change. We Germans will never forget that Americans have done to help us after World War II and the peak of the Cold War. The United States has always been a strong partner for Germany, a warrant for peace, for stability, prosperity, and freedom in Germany. In November, we will celebrate 25 years 
of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And you know who forecasted it two years ago. It was Ronald Reagan who called to President Gorbachev in Berlin to tear down the Berlin Wall. It happened two years later. The world has changed tremendously since then. The Cold War is history. Difficult already for my kids to understand what happened, that we couldn't cross the frontier from one end of Germany to the other. Germany is reunited. And I want to take this opportunity to thank our American friends for their trust and their patience, their vision, their conviction, and contributions to this process. All of that building is building a very strong common bond which will help us to master the challenges of globalization. Thank you for your time and patience, and thank you for your interest. Thank you very much. And obviously, now I'm still available for your remarks, comments, questions, whatever. That was a fascinating um, talk and, and quite controversial. Uh, you, you kind of bring up the, the issue of fr fifth freedom rights that the Middle Eastern carriers have uh, access to, uh, which is certainly appropriate from their perspective, but it creates a, an unlevel playing field with, uh, with the traditional network carriers like yourselves and United and Delta. It's, so what can you do about the, this from a governmental standpoint? Is there a way to restrict uh, or change the, the freedoms of, to fly? Or how, how do you go about fixing that problem? Um, I think, first of all, the first thing is uh, let's uh, take away unilateral burdens for our own industry. That's what is easily, uh, um, uh, can be easily done uh, from our national governments. The second element, and some of you might be aware, others not, unfortunately the airline industry is not part of the World Trade Organization and we are not able to appeal to the um, uh, WTO in order to safeguard fair competition in the airline industry. So the fairness of uh, any agreement in bilateral air traffic is regulated by the bilateral air service agreement between the United States and third countries or um, uh, the uh, European states and third countries. In the past, um, maybe we have created such agreements um, with many countries where there was no airline partner on the other side because you always try to, to balance out these kind of agreements. Um, but this situation obviously has changed. And I'm less talking only about the fifth freedom issue, but I'm also talking about how can we create rules for fair competition. And in the end, if this is not working out, we have to modify the existing agreement, maybe introducing some capacity caps. Um, for, for example, it's just to take the uh, air service agreement between Germany and the United Arab Emirates. There is an agreement that uh, um, each side can serve four airports or four markets in the other country. It's a bit difficult because uh, there are not that many airports in the UAE, but uh, so basically you are flying to two airports uh, and uh, the ca carriers of this country flying to four different airports. But is it the number of airports which is relevant? I feel it's more the, the, the capacity development. And when you look at the situation, we have uh, approximately 29 uh, uh, weekly frequencies, all German carriers together to fly to the UAE. And from the UAE, we have approximately 129 uh, frequencies the other way around. So the balance is already extremely distorted. I'm not even talking about rebalancing it, but I would be already grateful to keep the balance where it is today. And that is an issue which is obviously a, a sensitive political issue, um, since uh, you know that uh, Germany is not only consisting of an airline, but there are many industrial corporations who want to export in these countries. Yeah? Whether it's um, air 
craft exports or whether it's machinery tools or whatever. So the interest uh, in this case is uh, not, not easy to align even within the country. But we should aware that if we are not taking consequences, um, we will uh, maybe uh, confronted with a situation where, where uh, in the end it is too late. Uh, and uh, that is exactly where we have been vocal and I was happy to learn that the sensitivity also with regard to this development has dramatically increased in the last three to four years here in the United States. Um, Lufthansa is, of course, a world-leading airline, as you've uh, uh, outlined, but it also uh, was a world leader beginning in the 90s in cleaving off various support functions into what have, of course, become uh, world leaders in, in various uh, areas. And I wonder if you've got any comments on the um, going forward strategy of the group in respect of those uh, other, I would call them ancillary businesses, but I think, in fact, they're, they're, they're larger in revenue than the airline at this point. You're absolutely right. Uh, for example, Lufthansa Technik, being the largest uh, OEM independent uh, provider of uh, maintenance, repair, and overhaul services worldwide, and also LSG Sky Chefs being the number one catering company worldwide. And to give you some idea, every fourth meal on any aircraft worldwide is delivered by, by LSG. So these tiny um, in-house departments over the years have developed into very big businesses. We feel that um, the integration of these businesses inside the Lufthansa Group is a strategic asset. It's not a liability because the, 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 the economic cycle is different in these business as compared to the airline business. So it is stabilizing the bottom line of the group and there are substantial synergies between these businesses and, and the airline business. So it works in, in both directions, and that's the reason why we have not in, uh, no intention to disintegrate uh, the aviation services with, uh, uh, from, from the airline business. But um, clearly, in the end of the day, we are still aware, given the importance of the airlines inside the group, that this is the heart and the core of the, of the Lufthansa group. Uh, but as long as we have enough financial means to uh, basically uh, uh, invest uh, in the replacement and growth of uh, the airline business, and as long as we have enough means to develop also these aviation services, um, uh, we are happy to maintain the current structure. If this is changing, we have to be open for a change ourselves, but I don't see any reason in the uh, 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 mid-term perspective, at least, that this is going to change, and we're very happy to continue to develop these businesses. Uh, I'm a Wings Club member, thanks to Bruce Whitman. Uh, I'm also CEO of Veterans Advantage, and uh, we have partnered with United Airlines to thank America's veterans with special discounts um, on every day on the tickets that they buy. And we were introduced to Lufthansa and we now have a, a partnership with you. And I want to take this opportunity, Dr. France, to thank you for your support of America's veterans and their family members. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. It was incredible, very informative, and I know everybody enjoyed it. And we have a small gift on behalf of the Wings Club. Um, I'd like to present to you a nice plaque commemorating uh, today's speech. Oh, so wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.